to the Minute Women podcast. My name is Grace. And I'm Linnea. And me and Linnea had the best day ever today. Oh, we had such a nice day. Not to rub it in your guys' faces yeah. or anything. But I don't know how your day's going, but uh, <laughs> our day was excellent. So today, uh, a pal of mine who I went to university with at Acadia, we uh, took Grace into the valley and had the most lovely valley day. That's true. Um, I'm a real valley girl now. Yeah. Yeah, we had a great time. We hit up some wineries and um, some of my, our favorite restaurants. And uh, <laughs> we ate a lot and we drank a lot and we frolicked. And <laughs> we frolicked. <laughs> well, we went to um, Benjamin Bridge yeah. uh, Vineyard, which yeah, the is a beautiful winery. Oh, and 10 out of 10, gotta go. So nice. Highly recommend. Yeah. It was very beautiful. But as we like pull down the road and then we like pull into the parking lot, we just hear like in the vineyard oh. <laughs> like this look the it sounds like a velociraptor yeah. from dress it's apart like, it's just like <laughs> and we're just like oh my god yeah. what is that noise it sounded, like, it sounded like a velociraptor or if you're like recognizing that we don't have dinosaurs here like animals dying and being yeah. murdered like it was awful something very violent was happening in the vineyard yeah. and we go and we sit down and they're like oh yeah that's just the noise we play to like scare birds off yeah. so birds don't land i was like oh that makes sense but also really uh, impacts the atmosphere yeah exactly <laughs> it was really fun and like we had a great time regardless and we were just kind of making fun of it the whole time but yeah. it, every once in a while we'd be like mid wine sip and it would just be like <laughs> Yeah, it was it was really weird, and they had like a kite that looked like a bird to help yeah. scare the birds away. It just seemed like um, a lot of effort <laughs> to to, uh, sure. to keep the birds away. I'm curious if they were trying to get rid of like one specific bird right. or one specific animal, and they're just like these. The specific pest has just elevated itself above being scared of scarecrows. Right? <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> oh, you thought you could fool me, bitch. Yeah. No, not today. Only velociraptors are the thing that will scare me. Exactly. They're my only weakness. My only fear. <laughs> oh, oh, you have one? You have ten? And Benjamin yeah. Bridged is just behind his desk and he's just <laughs> like, oh, we have the technology. <laughs> All this uh, innovation to scare animals. So Great. funny. So funny. <laughs> but do you want to know what minute we are doing? Of this course I do. Week? Of course I do. I'm actually, yeah, I'm excited. Well, I felt it was only appropriate. Oh, oh, wait. Wait, first. First. A new Heritage Minute came out. And that's the one we're doing. Shut up. Yeah. No I way. I it was only appropriate if we do the brand new one no that just way. came out. Yeah. That's so cool. I actually I just watched it. I know. And you were making some Instagram posts. So <gasps> I was like, she knows a little bit about it. She's wow. done her own Guys, research. Guys, this was not planned. No, not this at all. This was not planned. Yeah. We're going to do Whoa. the Elsie McGill so cool. Heritage Minute, which is the most recent Heritage the Minute to be released. The Queen of the Hurricanes. Queen of the Hurricanes. Yeah. This is a wicked nickname. Wicked title. Um, I had never heard of Elsie McGill before they put out the Heritage Minute. No, I had not. And I, I, I mean, just assuming, which you know what happens when you assume, Grace, but uh, <laughs> I, I just figured she had something to do with McGill University, but nope, spelt differently. No. And uh, yeah, it doesn't seem to have, from what I saw, much affiliation. Um, so yeah. But, yeah, no, she has no affiliation with the school specifically, right. but it's... The story of her, she's the first aeronautical engineer, female aeronautical engineer in the world, I yeah. believe. As as far as we know, she is the yeah. first. Documented in official yeah. documentation. She's yeah. definitely the first in North America. <laughs> yes. And as far as we know, the first in the world. Yeah. And it's about her participation during the Second World War and in helping design and manufacture yeah. and hurricanes. Just, just which being were, a boss. Yeah. Totally cool. The Heritage Minute is very long, actually. Yeah. Like, it feels long. I, I guess they're all about a it minute. It feels but. long, but it's also just the cinematography is good. I know. Like, it it's really just, pops. It's filmed well, and it's like you can tell they put some money into this one. <laughs> yeah. Like, this isn't. There's a lot of characters. This isn't like the Laura Secord episode where she's <laughs> running through, you know, a random wooded area <laughs> next to your grandma's house. Like, this is this is legit. There's staging. There are extras. This is real. This is... I'm just thinking it would be really funny if the Laura Secord one was just the same stretch of woods over and over again, just shot from different it angles. Definitely which was. It definitely was. It definitely <laughs> was. It was like, run this way. Okay, now run this way. <laughs> no, run back. No, fall Forward. down. Fall down. <laughs> yeah, there's no falling down in this one, though. So, no. Yeah, it's like a reporter coming to meet Elsie to so discuss cool. 
the 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 factory and the construction of hurricanes and then all of the female staffers and right. they make a very strong point of her stating that it's not the fact that she's like hiring women like that's not the point like they're yeah. they're employees they're not women yeah etc cetera, etc cetera. misogynistic trope well, of a reporter blah yeah. blah blah and i'm sure you'll tell me but i i mean i I mean, obviously, she was also the boss of men, though. Yeah. Which I think is, like, also super cool, especially for the time. Like, she she was smarter than a lot of dudes who were there. Absolutely. And And that's Feminism is a huge part of her story. Oh, cool. She was a huge advocate for women's rights and women's equality in the workplace. And, yeah, she's, like, so, like, super badass. Tell me all about her. All righty. So, Elizabeth Muriel Gregory, or Elsie McGill, was born in Vancouver on March 27, 1905. She was the youngest daughter of James McGill, a prominent Vancouver lawyer, part-time journalist, and Anglican deacon. Man, he's wearing all the hats. Yeah, many jobs. Many jobs. (laughs) Many jobs. Her mother, Helen Gregory McGill, was a pioneer in education and a role model for her daughters. Oh, cool. She was the first woman in the British Empire to earn a bachelor's degree in music. By 1890, she had completed a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Arts in Mental and Moral Philosophy. Imagine that being your mother. (laughs) <laughs> mental and moral philosophy in mental and moral philosophy she's like do you want to think about what yeah. you've just done she's how like, does that, i guess so how does that make you feel yeah, Elsie? <laughs> yeah. how do you think that made everyone else feel yeah do you think you're contributing to society the way that you're mm. acting it's like oh my yeah God. that's a lot <laughs> so after Elsie's mother's first husband, Frederick Charles Flesher, died in 1901. Mm -hmm. She worked as a journalist to support her then two young sons. So as a single mother, her mother was trying, like, working and supporting her children. So Elsie's dad died. So this is Elsie's mother's first husband. Oh, okay. So her father is alive, but this is kind of like her mother's background a little bit. The following year, Elsie's mother married uh, former classmate James. So that's when they get married. And Helen taught herself law in 1917. She became the first woman judge appointed in British Columbia. So her mom is also just this, like, A judge. That is moral. (laughs) Like, her mom is just, like, the queen of morality. Yeah. (laughs) Literally her job to judge you. Yeah. Elsie had an older sister, Dr. Helen uh, McGill Hughes, uh, who (laughs) goes by young Helen. (laughs) Because they have the same name as a mom. <laughs> Old Helen and young Helen. <laughs> Literally. And I've also seen in a few places they would call her Helen Jr., which I've never seen a woman I love that. I junior. just, sidebar, I think it is badass when women name their daughters, like, after themselves. Even if it's a middle name. Yeah. Because it's so, like, that's so typical of men. Like, it's, it's very true. assumed in a lot of situations that, like, oh, his middle name will be his dad's. Or, like, oh, yeah. it'll just be named after his dad. Like, it's not. But you never see like women naming their daughters after themselves and that's true there was a woman in uh, in lunenburg a teacher actually and she uh she had a daughter and her name's christina and she named her daughter chloe christina and oh, okay lunenburg <laughs> small town people were like what i don't think that's appropriate yeah and you i was like call her cc that right? would be cute and i was like that's awesome i think that's awesome yeah i like it yeah you're great Flex. name your kid after yourself Flex. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so Elsie is really close with her sister, Helen. Okay. Um, they, they were so close that the the family would often refer to them as Helnelsi. <laughs> oh. Like, li- they, they were the first, like, ship name. Yeah. They just shipped their names Hel- together. Helnelsi. Helnelsi. Which Hel-Nelsi. Is, doesn't really roll off the tongue either. Hello. What about Elson? Yeah, that's a little weird. Or, like, just, like, Ellen. I don't know. Anyway. That's weird. Not our. Don't do that. Not our problem. <laughs> Daughters sh- should be named after their mothers. Yeah. But like, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> that part's weird. So both Elsie's parents shared aspects of their legal practice with their family. Helen also laid the groundwork for her daughter's feminist development. The children's maternal grandmother, suffragist Emma Gregory, helped in this regard as well. So also her grandmother is a feminist. Is a suffragette. Yeah. yeah. So feminism was really woven into the children's lives from a really early age. Yeah. When Elsie was 12 years old, her mother was appointed judge of the Juvenile Court of Vancouver. After 1911, racial strife. That's crazy. I know. That must have been one of the first female judges in 
probably in British Canada. North America. In Canada, yeah. Because yeah. what, what year did you say that was? So that would have been when she was 12. So it would have been... She was born in 1905? Uh, yes. So it would have been in 1917. Yeah. Okay. Which is interesting. I wonder if it was due to a lack of men. <gasps> right, because they're away military. at war. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Potentially. Interesting. Not sure. Cool, though. Pretty early on, it's kind of like the mother in the family is the figurehead of the family. Right. Because in 1911, there was racial strife in British Columbia, um, and her father, Jim's immigration-related legal work was directly impacted by this, and this caused a lot of financial strain on the family. Yeah. Hear that, folks? Racism in Canada. Again, it was there. It's still here. It's here, it's there, it's everywhere. And weird, it's negatively impacting everyone. Everyone. (laughs) It's almost bad if we're racist. Yeah, it's not good. Kind of weird, kind Uh, of quirky. (laughs) People are dumb. (laughs) Um, But so this like financial strain kind of shifts the power dynamic in the family a little bit. And it also pushes Elsie to learn this early aptitude to be good at fixing things. Okay. So, like, the there's financial need for her to just be kind of a good fix-it person. Right. And so, and she really loves it. So that's something that was pretty early on in her development. Yeah. In the early years, the McGill children were homeschooled in a formal setting to mimic that of Lord Roberts, the public school that the older boys attended. So her older half-brothers, I believe, are at public school, but the two girls, they're being homeschooled right. to begin. This included drawing lessons with Emily Carr. Shut up. So Emily Carr was like, these are some of her students that she tutored that we Shut talked about. your face. I know, right? We have like a direct crossover. I think that's really cool. That's so cool. <laughs> And it also included swimming lessons with Joe Fortes, who oh. was Vancouver's first lifeguard. Hmm. Great swimmer. <laughs> Apparently. I hope so. <laughs> Later, they attended... These girls are, like, high society. Yeah, I mean, it's... I, I don't know how well off they are, because it doesn't seem like they're particularly well off. But, but they also, definitely come from a certain class. Well, and I was going to say, it's also war times. That's true. So nobody's really... Nobody's really got... Nobody's really rolling in the money. Yeah, I mean, if you were wealthy, it wouldn't have really I impacted suppose. you that much. Yeah. But I don't think they're quite there. Yeah, they're pro- okay. they, they seem like they're like new middle class, new money, you know? New money, yeah, new that's, money. no, and that makes sense because if you're talking about her parents, like those jobs, that's new money. That's not like, like yeah, like lawyers That's not like stuff. years <laughs> of old money. Not inheriting yeah. stuff. Exactly. Later, the girls attended King George Secondary School, which was affiliated with McGill University. Okay. So it... They don't have any familial affiliation with McGill, but they are affiliated with the university through their secondary school. Right. This rigorous education facilitated Elsie entering University of British Columbia when she was just 16 years old. (laughs) We're off early. We've got a nerd on our hands. She's a smart one. (laughs) She was admitted to the Applied Sciences program and finished her first two years of that program. In 1923, Elsie enrolled at the University of Toronto's School of Practical Science in Electrical Engineering. Woof. This was a bold move, as she was the first woman admitted to the engineering program. And she's, like, 18. Yeah. And to this day, engineering, I mean, STEM in general is, like, yeah. pretty difficult for women to break into. But engineering especially is yeah. so, like, heavy on heavily male dominated Uh uh-huh yeah my roommate is a a lady engineer so is mine (laughs) yeah that's true both (laughs) of our roommates are lady engineers yeah lady engineers grace just uh did a really nice robot dance when she said lady engineers there was a lot of stiff arm (laughs) movement it was really nice to watch but yeah it's crazy looking at even just like class photos that she has or just hearing about the friends that she makes at school they're like all men there's yeah. like a handful of girls that she goes to school with yeah. and, and knows pretty well. And the rest of them are just dudes. Her decision to enter engineering was influenced by her mother's advocation of women's rights and involvement with suffrage. At times, her presence caused quite a stir among her male classmates. However, by graduation, few questions remained about her suitability as an engineer. In fact, Elsie forged many strong friendships with her classmates. She maintained lifelong ties with her graduating class, serving prominently in its alumni body. 
During the summers as a student, Elsie worked in machine shops repairing electrical motors to supplement the theory and practical teachings during the school year. Mm -hmm. So she's also doing her little, like, co-ops in the machine shop. Just her and her coveralls (laughs) getting all greased up. Imagine. I bet bet she had to wear, like, a dress still. Yeah. (laughs) Probably just like, well, I don't know if you can be in the machine shop because, well, you have to wear a skirt all the time. Yeah. It's like in a league of their own when they were made to wear skirts to play baseball. Yeah, dirt and skirt. Yeah. (laughs) It is also here that Elsie became exposed to the nascent field of aeronautical engineering. When Elsie convocated in 1927, she walked across the stage as Canada's first woman to graduate in electrical engineering. Cool. Super cool. That is really cool. Yeah. It's also got to be really interesting to be her parents because when her parents are growing up, electricity isn't even right. really that right. widespread that's true and so to then watch your daughter go through a program and now she is an electrical engineer like there's enough of yeah. a market for electricity just over the span of their lifetime yeah to have specific degrees to get people into that field yeah i feel like cool. that's like really revolutionary that's i think it's cool. kind of like our parents seeing like kids go into it maybe or yeah. going into different like social media jobs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So following graduation... Or having a podcast. Or having a (laughs) podcast. It is definitely on the same level as graduating with a degree in electrical engineering. Definitely. Starting a podcast. (laughs) Definitely. My parents are super proud of me. Uh. (laughs) So following graduation, Elsie took a junior position as a mechanical engineer with an automobile company in Pontiac, Michigan. Okay. I don't think the company is actually Pontiac. But it's in Pontiac, Michigan. Okay. (laughs) Her role focused on stress analysis in automobiles. However, during her time there, the company began producing aircraft, which furthered Elsie's interest in aeronautics. Very cool. Yeah. So it's like also just mind blowing to me that you would be working on like cars and stuff and then also just be like, but what about planes? Yeah. (laughs) It's like, but what if we made the car go in the air? (laughs) Um, so she's working full time, but then she starts part time graduate studies in aeronautics at the University of Michigan. Before long, these studies became full time, studying in the Master of Science and Engineering program to begin aircraft design work and conduct research and development in the university's new aeronautics facility. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It's also amazing because, kind of like we talked about in the Marion Orr episode uh-huh. because the field is so new and so fresh right it's almost like there's less discrimination against women yeah it's just kind of it, there's such a, a a small group of people to draw from right to be interested in it in the first place that it's almost like she has more opportunity yeah, you to can, be a leader in the field yeah, you can't discriminate yeah, yeah it's like i'm just as much of a leader as everyone else i've been here for just as long as everybody else right kind of thing yeah In 1929, she completed her master's degree in aeronautical engineering. This was a groundbreaking step for women. It effectively made Elsie the first woman aeronautical engineer in the world. However, Elsie's celebration was cut short when she was diagnosed with polio in 1929. Hence the cane and the the heritage. I was wondering when we were going to get to the cane. Okay, okay. Yeah. Which. Also, circling back to a previous episode, I hope everybody's listening to all the episodes because yeah. the amount we self-reference our own episodes is at a, this point, is a yeah, lot. as the episodes go on. But definitely. when we did the John Peters Humphrey episode, they like don't make any point of highlighting the fact that he oh, does, doesn't have, have an, an arm. arm. Right, right, but right. But in this one, it's not that polio is really relevant to her story in any way, but they do make a point of being like. Yes, she used a cane to walk yeah. because she had polio at one point in her life. Like, it just feels a little more well-researched well and it feels a little more honest about the story. Yeah. 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 And, I mean, at this point in 2020, I like to think that there's a broader and more understanding uh, scope to the success uh, of people with disabilities yeah, and yeah. with medical conditions. And so that's, you know, that's not something that we hide or like don't acknowledge anymore. Yeah. Like, that's like something to be celebrated. To be, yeah. That's fine to be talked about. And it's, it's, you know, it's something that m- is part of a human being and a person. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. 
So Elsie was told by doctors that she would probably spend the rest of her life in a wheelchair. Oh. But she just refused to accept that as a possibility. She Go, Elsie. Like, uh, pff, no. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> the doctor being like, you're going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. And you're like, mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. That doesn't sound like something I do. Yeah. Yeah, that just doesn't really fit my vibe. Uh, that's not in the cards for me. Yeah. I'm like a walkie person. Yeah. You know? <laughs> We were, we were driving back from the valley. We were listening to the radio. And there was a radio commercial that was like for a class for beginners hiking. Oh, yeah. And I was just like, that's just walking. Yeah. And especially. You don't need a class for that. No. And especially Nova Scotia. For those yeah. of you who are listening who are like in Alberta or like like BC, you know, where you've got like mountains and like yeah. rocky terrain. Like I have a friend who's from, she's from East Hans actually, which we drove through today. Shout mm-hmm. out to Erica. Uh, Erica moved to Alberta almost two years ago, maybe. And she's gotten really into hiking and the hikes that she does are serious. Like yeah. you would need an intro to that. Like she's got gear and there's like walkie talkies and GPSs and you're like, it, it's like intense. You're going on an expedition. Yeah. Like this is athletic and it takes like all day. Like she gets up at like five 30 in the morning to go and she gets back at the end of the day. Like that, that I would want an intro to. I yeah. wouldn't want to just like put on my sneakers and go. Yeah. I would say that's like an intro to advanced hiking. Yeah. To hike in Nova <laughs> Scotia. Um, we have mud. It's and like we a, have rocks. Rocks. Uh, we have tides that could potentially come in and wash you away. But other than that, like the worst thing that's going to happen to you on a hike is you're going to get ticks on you and you might get Lyme disease. But like bears. It's bears. I saw a bear. Other than bears. <laughs> but yeah, no need for an intro to hike. Psh, k, garbage. Yeah. I just think the concept of it itself is just so funny. because It's just like you just go and you do it. Yeah. If you're introing hiking, an intro hike is a walk. Yeah. In it's the just woods. a walk. <laughs> just go walk with a little bit of elevation, you know? Don't, you know what? Don't pay the money. Don't do it. Just listen to our podcast. We'll yeah. teach you everything you need to know. <laughs> we'll tell you everything you need. <laughs> we'll teach you everything you know. We'll hold your hand through life. Yeah. That's what the Minute Women are here to do. That's what we're here to do. We're your Sherpas. <laughs> <laughs> we are your historic... We're your... <laughs> Your historical Sherpas. Your Sherpas. <laughs> for historical, factual, sometimes not factual information. I think it's pretty factual. For We're, the most part. Yeah, you're a smart girl. I throw in a fake one every now and then. Just to see. Just to see the haters come at us, you know? <laughs> see if anyone's fact checking yeah. me. I dare you. I don't. Please don't. No. I don't like it. Anyway. Prince Edward Island is, in fact, attached to the rest of Canada. Yeah. It's not I mean, an it island. By the bridge. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Shh. We don't talk about the bridge. <laughs> so Elsie's like, no, I'm not going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. I've decided that that's not what I want to do. Go, girl, get it. So after her temporary confinement to a wheelchair, Elsie spent time recovering at home in Vancouver and learning how to walk with the support of true two strong metal canes. Okay. So like those two brace ones that you usually see. Oh, yeah. There was yeah. a character in Arthur who used those. The, like, badger. The badger. Yeah. Okay. No, not Arthur. I, not I, Arthur. Franklin. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like that. Wrong animal. That badger had polio. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. In addition to her physiotherapy regime, she drafted aircraft designs and wrote articles on aviation for popular publications like Chantelin, which is, I guess, a popular publication about airplanes. Oh, okay. I was like, are you trying to say Chatelaine? Because, like, that's oh, a yeah, that's what my Nana it reads. It's definitely oh. Chatelaine. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm so used to like, but like French words <laughs> popping up and having to be like, shit, how do Chatelaine you say Chatelaine is not like about airplanes though. Like it's about like cooking and like women's stuff. She's writing articles for it. That's cool. Well, she's a woman and I guess like it, yeah. I guess it originally probably I'm sure started just as like, a, what's it like being in the workplace? Yeah, but yeah, Chatelaine. <laughs> That's okay. Chatelaine. <laughs> Chatelaine. From here on. <laughs> I will always oh, think God. that is Chatelaine. I hate myself. <laughs> I'm just giving you a It's a Canadian that. magazine, though. It's cool. <laughs> she uh-huh. also participated in her mother's feminist activities. The Canadian <laughs> Federation of Business and Women's <laughs> Professional Clubs, so the CFBPWC, was among the feminist causes that she joined during this period of time. I'm just imagining. During, during her downtime, right? as it were. <laughs> I'm just imagining <laughs> feminist activities, you know. They watch, they watch their <laughs> husbands and fathers do the dishes and they just sit there <laughs> and they clap like golf clap, like, 
<laughs> and yeah. now you can dust the mantle. Yeah, they go out oh. and vote. <laughs> like, they go out and vote, but it's not yeah. an election or anything. No. They just go and find anywhere that's taking a poll or a survey. <laughs> and they're like, I will participate. Yeah. They're like, <laughs> what color do you want for the Afghan? Can't decide between purple and blue? We're here to uh, vote. We're here to vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to vote. Can we sign up just so we can vote? Thank you. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Elsie worked on a variety of aircraft designs and forged important professional ties with the aeronautical staff at the National Research Council of Canada in Ottawa, Ontario. She also showed her bravery by insisting on going up on dangerous test flights to monitor the performance of her designs. That's so cool. (laughs) But it's also just, it's bravery and sheer confidence in your design. She's like, I designed this plane and I will go down with it. (laughs) It's not going to work. Like, it's if you true. messed up hard, she's just like, nope, nope, I'm going up there. Yep. It'll be my fault. I will die with this design. <laughs> oh, gosh. In 1938, Elsie took a job as chief aeronautical engineer at Canadian Car and Foundry, which is Can Car, oh. in oh. present-day mm-hmm. Thunder Bay. The same year, Elsie's application for membership to the Engineering Institute of Canada was accepted. This made her the first woman member of the professional association. So, like, so cool. 1938 is a great year for Elsie. She's having a good time. (laughs) Good year. She presented a paper entitled Simplified Performance Calculations for Airplanes to the Royal Aeronautical Society in Ottawa on March 22nd, 1938 Ooh. to high praise. Oh. <laughs> and it was later published in the Engineering Journal. She also participated in the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's six-part series, The Engineer in Wartime. Her segment was called Aircraft Engineering in Wartime Canada. Wow. wow. Not... A lady does it. <laughs> a lady does war. Oh God, right? <laughs> so, as a woman, <laughs> what do you think about guns? <laughs> she said, I, I design airplanes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But what about being a nurse? Have you thought about that part? <laughs> do you find the men's uniforms appealing? How do you not get distracted by their sexy, sexy <laughs> bodies? <laughs> I... I no, I I work as an engineer. I design planes. Is it hard to be smart when you wear a skirt? What? No. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't think you understand what I do. Like, I don't work with soldiers. Oh, psh, I have to go talk to a man now. Uh, <laughs> you invited me here. <laughs> uh, the, all the whole interview. It was a weird episode. <laughs> In 1942, she was elected to the position of chairman of the EIC Lakehead branch after having also served as their vice chairman. So, you know, she's just, she's moving up in the engineering world. Upon her arrival at Kankar, Elsie undertook many projects. One of these projects was the design, construction, and testing of the Maple Leaf 2 trainer. While the plane was based on a previous model, Elsie completely re-engineered it and did so at impressive speed. She saw the prototype through the aerial testing very early in her tenure at Cancar. The plane never went into full production in Canada. However, it is recognized as the first aircraft designed and produced by a woman. Oh, very cool. And although the Maple Leaf 2 did not enter service in any Commonwealth forces, 10 were sold to Mexico where its high altitude performance was important given the many airfields from which it had to operate. Oh, okay. So it's a Mexican plane. <laughs> the Mexican army is flying Maple Leaf 2s. <laughs> Uh, I just think that's really funny. At least somebody appreciates her hard work. (laughs) After this achievement and the outbreak of the Second World War, Elsie oversaw the retooling of the Cancar plant. She equipped it to mass produce the Hawker Hurricane Fighter aircraft for the Royal Air Force. So that's the plane she's really known for. Okay. The Hurricane was one of the main fighters flown by Canadian and Allied airmen in the Battle of Britain. The factory quickly expanded from about 500 workers to 4,500 workers by the end of the war. Half of them were women. So she she goes from managing 500 people to 4,500 people. That's awesome. (laughs) For much of the war, Elsie's primary task was to streamline operations in the production line as the factories rapidly expanded. Right. Which is the other level of this is, of course, she's like designing the plane, but that... 
also means in mass production, you have to design the assembly lines. Right. She has to map out how the engines and every part gets built and what, like, where you build it and then you pass it on to the next stage. That's crazy. Okay, what do you do in this setting or this stage? Yeah. Which is so cool. Like, it's like designing an organism. Like, how does, like, a cell work? That's very cool. Yeah. The powerhouse of the cell <laughs> is the mitochondria. That's all I know. <laughs> That's all I know. Yeah, she she designed that. That's she really was like, cool. "What's our powerhouse?" Yeah. <laughs> it's you, Elsie. It's me. <laughs> She's the nucleus. Yeah. She's the nucleus of the cell. Oh. <laughs> Elsie was also responsible for designing solutions to allow the aircraft to operate during the winter, introducing de-icing controls and a system for fitting skis for landing on snow. <laughs> this was a massive undertaking. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> and really? Like, really. It's like, this was not easy. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know? Uh, Did you know that this is hard? It's hard work. In 1940, she wrote and presented a paper on the experience, which was entitled Factors Affecting Mass Production of Aeroplanes, which was later published in the Engineering Journal. Cool. The media was quick to latch on to the fact that a woman was serving as Kankar's chief aeronautical engineer during wartime. There were many articles that were written about Elsie. Her role in this successful production made her famous, even to the point of having a comic book biography appear in an issue of True Comics in 1942, yeah. using her nickname, Queen of the Hurricanes. I saw that. It was pretty cool. I know. It's just this, like, Archie comic almost. It really is. It really is. I was, like, her sitting at her desk designing airplanes. Yep. And then the airplanes <laughs> are flying, and they're like, Queen of the Hurricanes. Elsie McGill, Queen yeah. of the Hurricanes. Yeah. yeah I, it's... It's funny what they latch on to, I yeah. guess. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's like, and it's cool that she's celebrated in that role. Like, yeah. she's not, I didn't see anything that was questioning her or doubting her yeah. as an aeronautical engineer. It was very much just like, oh, wow, a woman's in this role. And people celebrated it yeah. and made a comic about that's it. Like, awesome. I think that's cool. I like that. There were numerous popular stories published about her in the media as well, reflecting the public's fascination with this female engineer. Uh -huh. So the public is like, no way. No <laughs> That's freaking crazy. way. <laughs> By the time the production line was shut down in 1943, Kankar had produced over 1,400 hurricanes. After hurricane production ended, Kankar looked for new work and secured a contract from the U.S. Navy to build Curtis SB2C Hell Divers. <laughs> it's like Queen of the Hurricanes, Queen of the Hell Divers. <laughs> hell Divers does not sound like a plane I'd ever want to get into. It's also like Hurricane is like, oh yeah, I get it. It's like wind. Yeah. Airplanes, whatever. It is so U.S. Navy to be like, yeah, we called them Hell Divers. <laughs> like... <laughs> Like, is this the army? Yeah. Or is this Superman? Yeah. <laughs> what are we doing? Can we take ourselves a little more seriously? <laughs> Can we Thank just you. call it a plane? Can we just give it a number? Just give it a number. <laughs> this production did not go nearly as smoothly, and a continual stream of minor changes from Curtis Wright, in turn demanded by the U.S. Navy, meant that full-scale production took a long time to get started. In the midst of this project, Elsie and the works manager, E.J. Soulsby, who is also known as Bill, were both dismissed from Kankar. So it's not clear whether Elsie and Bill resigned from their positions or were dismissed for whatever reason. It was initially rumored that Bill had been curt with a group of senior naval officers who had visited a few weeks earlier earlier but it was later revealed that a more likely reason for the dismissals was that the two were having an affair <gasps> scandal Elsie, Elsie. dog mm. <laughs> uh, this was also further uh, evidence uh, due to the fact that shortly after Elsie and Bill got married <laughs> oh okay <laughs> so the two get married and they relocate to Toronto Ontario nice. which I also when I was starting the project, I was like, oh, her parents' last names are McGill. She's not going to get married. But I think she keeps her last name. Oh, like, bad I don't think ass. she changes her. Yeah, like, on most of the records, she's referred to as Elsie McGill. So cool. either it's because she did all of this stuff before she was married. But also, after she gets married, she continues to work. I like that. Um, yeah. I like that Like, re lot. regardless of the fact that they both left Cancar, neither of them suffered professionally. Which I'm yeah. like, yay. Very cool. Progressive. Yeah, that's awesome. 
Bill took a new job as plant manager at Victory Aircraft Limited in Malton, Ontario, while Elsie went on to found her own successful consulting engineering company. Of course she did. She's like, oh, I'll just make my own company. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, you want to, you want to see the queen? (laughs) Yeah. She's like not the boss. She's not like the executive. She's the queen. Yeah. Oh, you wanted to see the queen of the hurricanes? Yes. Come right in. Yes. Come in. Also, that is not to like no, 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 no. But that is totally what she like was called in bed, a hundred percent. Oh, it's like Bill. She's like, she's like, say it, say, say it. it, Bill. He's like, oh, come on. She's like, El- say it, Elsie, Elsie, stop. Say it, Bill. Queen of the Hurricanes. Oh, it's like, <laughs> it's like that's where I like it. <laughs> oh, We're funny. funny sometimes. We joke. We try. <laughs> Elsie had strong support from her colleagues at the Engineering Institute of Canada in her consulting business. In 1946, Elsie became the first woman to serve as technical advisor for the International Civil Aviation Organization. A lot of shuns today. Cool. Yeah. Any aviation society has to have the longest fucking name in the world. Apparently. apparently. <laughs> And there she helped draft the International Airworthiness Regulations for the design and production of commercial aircraft. Cool lady. She's just doing cool stuff. But wait, there's more. Oh, my gosh. In 1947, she became the chairman of the United Nations Stress Analysis Committee. So that made her the first woman to ever chair a UN committee. Yes. Elsie, get it. Before Eleanor Roosevelt. Yep. (laughs) Elsie was number one. Elsie, then Ellie, you know? (laughs) In 1952, Elsie presented a paper to the Society of Women Engineers Conference, the Initiative in Airline Design, that was subsequently published in the Engineering Journal. So she always presents a paper. It's like, and then it was published in the Engineering, Engineering Journal. Because they were like, this is mwah, perfection. Perfection. It doesn't get better than this. It's like, it's like in a Christmas story when Ralphie's teacher reads his theme. And she's yeah. like, oh, Oh, A plus, 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 plus. We've also plus. made that reference on the podcast before. Have we? Yeah, we oh, absolutely my have. My material's getting old and stale. <laughs> and repetitive. Oh, I'm, I'm trash. I'm useless. I'm just, I'm go- I'm just gonna go. <laughs> I have one job here to be funny and relevant, and here I am reusing material <laughs> from a movie that came out in the 1980s. <laughs> Garbage. But I love that movie. And Christmas is like Christmas, less than two months away. Christmas is coming. I love Christmas. The goose is getting fat. <laughs> It's time to put a penny in the old man's hat. Do you know that? Do you know that little ditty? I don't know that one. Um, So a year after her presentation to the conference, she was awarded their annual engineering award. Well, great. Duh. She's decorated. Yeah. So Elsie was not afraid to question government policy when it came to the balance between civil and military aviation. The 1956 report she submitted to the Royal Commission on Canada's Economic Prospects is one example of this. In the report, Elsie questioned Canada's focus on developing military aviation projects at the expense of civil aviation. Hmm. So, which I also think is really interesting because for her, her whole career is, and, and her fame at least, is built on designing military aircrafts. Right. But for her, she thinks it's poor economic investments to just be developing military aviation she's like you should be considering civil aviation and commercial aviation which i believe is probably the thing that eventually builds like air canada and stuff like air canada when it was still a public uh company and not a private terrible airline (laughs) yeah yeah Mm -hmm. air canada it's a shame that is one of the things where it's like parents generation talking to us it's just like yeah. back in the day air canada it was the best yeah. it was so good they were so friendly to you now air canada's <laughs> the worst yep <laughs> yeah how the mighty have fallen how the mighty have fallen <laughs> so elsie's words of caution seemed justified when the diefenbaker government canceled the avro arrow in 1959 Aww. which we'll do a heritage minute on eventually will, the eventually. avro arrow another one one of them that i think is a little strange yeah like i don't i know the avro arrow heritage minute i have no idea why the avro arrow is significant to canada (laughs) not really but we'll learn someday someday elsie was not only a trailblazing engineer but also a prominent canadian feminist Hmm. as a liberal feminist she believed in change via the reform of existing laws and policies 
She also had some radical ideas for the time. For instance, Elsie believed that women should have full control over their own bodies. (laughs) Radical. (laughs) Wild. She therefore considered the issue of abortion a private matter between a woman and her doctor. At the time, abortion was illegal under the Canadian Criminal Code, and it was not decriminalized until 1988. So I've got no problems with Elsie. Yeah, honestly. Elsie's a queen. She's great. Like, I... Not only is she, like, amazing and smart, she overcomes having polio. She, like... She's pro-choice before that's even a word. Before, like, even (laughs) pro-choice isn't even... That's not even coined. She's just like, oh, I think that women should be allowed to make this decision with, like, them and their doctor. And I think that's just well enough. Yeah. She had, like, a good father and mother figures A sister who she, like, cared about and didn't die in a brutal attack. I don't know. Like, (laughs) things sound, like... It's amazing that she succeeded so much without having any trauma, <laughs> any trauma early on. And she's married in what sounds like a healthy relationship. Yeah, it seems pretty good. Like, Yeah. 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 <laughs> they left their jobs and they were together and then they found work elsewhere. Go like, Elsie. Crazy. So after Elsie's mother dies in 1947, which, you know, an appropriate age yeah. <laughs> to have your mother pass away. She's an adult. Yeah. <laughs> Elsie was determined to capture her important achievements. When Elsie broke her leg in 1953, she used the opportunity of her months of healing to sort through her mother's papers and begin writing a biography of her mother's life. So cool. So also, whenever she can't walk, she's, like, doing great stuff. Yeah. (laughs) She's just like, she's like, I'm going to draft all of these designs for airplanes, or I'm going to write a whole book. Have I done that before? Not yet, but I can do it. Yeah. Watch me do it. She's a doer. (laughs) She published My Mother, the Judge, a biography of Helen Gregory McGill in 1955. Cool. This project served to reignite Elsie's feminist activism. She renewed her work with the Canadian Federation of Business and Professional Women's Club. Before long, she rose to key leadership roles in the organization. Elsie served as the CFB PWC's. <laughs> it's not shorter to say I out hate loud. That. I get why you'd write it. <laughs> But to say it, no. Out loud is a lot. Um, She became their provincial president from 1956 to 1958, and its national president from 1962 to 1964. Imagine this lady's resume. Oh, stellar. (laughs) Stellar. Who wouldn't hire her? Like, she'd... The weight of it, when she'd drop it on your table. It'd be like a thunk. (laughs) Thunk. And at the top it says, Elsie, Queen of the Hurricanes, McGill. (laughs) (laughs) She's like, I was also in a comic book once. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> I've included a photocopy. It's appendix three. <laughs> I can fax it to you if you'd like. Do you want to sign? Of course I can sign it. They're like, oh no, you don't need to sign oh, anything. And she's like, I know you want one sign. for One for your daughter too? Okay. <laughs> I brought extras. Oh God, I love meeting plans. <laughs> oh, this is a job interview? Oh. I mean, I got the job, right? It's like, yeah, you got the job, but... <laughs> I love meeting fans. I love meeting fans. <laughs> so, in particular, in her role in the society, she advocated that Canada would improve with the proper consideration and use of woman power. Nice. So she's like, women gotta get in the workplace. Yeah, they do, Elsie. That's gonna help the country overall. Cool. I agree. <laughs> Uncontroversially, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say something that is both controversial and brave. <laughs> I think women should be allowed to work. From 1967 to 1970, Elsie served on the Royal Commission on the Status of Women in Canada. Her co-commissioners acknowledged her as the leading feminist among them. Chairwoman Florence Bird lauded Elsie's keen leadership and organizational skills. For the rest of her life, Elsie worked to see as many of the report's 167 recommendations implemented as possible. She made such efforts on her own and jointly with groups like the National Action Committee on the Status of Women and the Ontario Committee on the Status of Women. She's a cool lady. Yeah, she's a doer for sure. Not much of a like sit back and and watch the world go around kind of person. Also, I do feel like her life would be so stressful. (laughs) But I guess she just loves it. I guess she loves airplanes. She seems to thrive on that though. Yeah, like I don't know what her hobbies are. I don't know if she has any hobbies, but I guess you don't need a hobby when you love your job that much. I guess. I guess. Well, she wrote a book. 
She wrote a book. That's true. It's she broke. She broke her leg, and it forced her to take some time off. Yeah. It's just like it's like oh god, I broke my leg, and Bill's just like thank god. Yeah. Oh. Take some time off, jeez. <laughs> So Elsie always rejected the label of woman engineer. She really didn't like that. All right. Her perspective was that she was an engineer, period. The fact that she was a woman did not need to be highlighted. Darn straight, Elsie. Yeah, which I also find interesting because, I mean, all of those stories came out. I guess it's more in her face because all of that media attention was drawn to her. Yeah. But for her, she really doesn't think the fact that she's a woman is interesting. She's like, that's the least interesting thing about me. Yeah. (laughs) We can talk about my engineering, but, like, why why does that matter? Yeah. After all, she had proven time and time again that her sex in no way impacted her ability to do her job. Elsie's rise in engineering had been relatively unchallenged. For most of her career, she was largely blind to any discrimination she experienced, Hmm. As a result, she did not personally see the engineering profession as discriminatory. Right. And while she supported women taking up science and engineering, this was not the focus of her activism. Right. Which I also find interesting. Yeah. Like, she wants women to get into the workplace, but because her experience was so positive, she doesn't have the nuance to understand why you might need specific STEM right. promotion for right. women. It's, yeah, it's like, and it's that really is interesting. interesting. Yeah. And I think it might be because she moved into a field that was so small at the time. Yeah. She could move quite quickly to a position where she's chief engineer and no one can tell you shit anymore. Because she knows more than you. Yeah. Literally. It's like, I know more than you and there's no one higher up than me in this company. Yeah. So. Yeah. My life's great. <laughs> I'm doing great. We're thriving over <laughs> on, on Island McGill over here. <laughs> On Queen of the Hurricane Island. I'm Queen of this island. I don't know if you know. (laughs) You want an autograph? (laughs) Okay. Later in her life, she did start to see some of these challenges. So it wasn't until 1970 that she fully realized the challenges women in engineering faced because of their sex. This awareness came following the publication of an article that proposed training women as engineering aides. In the article, dark, yeah, it's like, will we? They might be able to assist us. Yeah. <laughs> In the article, Dr. F. P. J. Rimmett took a sexist assumption as the basis for his idea of creating this new subordinate position. Rimmett wrote, "Quote: Women favor jobs that do not involve certain duties, of which some are unfortunately characteristic of engineering, such as design, risk projects, travel." field or shop work, Ugh. physically and mentally demanding tasks, oh, no. supervisory positions, Shut up. and major responsibilities. I hate this man. So women hate anything that would make you a boss. A leader. <laughs> anything that yeah. would put you not in a subordinate position. Women like being subordinate. <laughs> women don't want to travel. They want to stay at home. Women don't want to do anything that would be risk projects. What's risk projects? What is that? <laughs> Women just want to be safe and coddled. (laughs) And they're made to feel small. And they have tiny, tiny hands. So tiny. The tiny hands will not fit the tools. We've already (laughs) discussed this. God, how could you be so stupid? They can't lift things. Their wrists are so delicate. (laughs) And their brains are so small. So small. You have no idea. (laughs) It's amazing that they get out of the house every day and go to the grocery store and not have mental breakdowns. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I agree with that. (laughs) What can I say? The grocery store is stressful. What can I say? Yeah. (laughs) The controversial article caused an intense debate about women in engineering. It was... Also, what prompted Elsie to reflect on her own career and acknowledge that she, too, had faced discrimination. She became a vocal critic of discrimination within the profession and a strong advocate for women in engineering, Hmm. which I think is such an interesting turning point because I'm sure, and I think I've been there, where I didn't want to associate myself or, like, see myself as a victim of something. Yeah. It's like... No, it's it's like I managed to achieve everything that I've achieved. And like for me to look back on that and say that I was a victim of circumstances or because I was seen as lesser, I was like 
expectations weren't put on me. Right. Or, like, people didn't expect me to do well. So I did well because no one wanted me to. Yeah. Like, I didn't want that narrative for myself. Right. But then over time, it's like, oh, no, it's like, it's really harmful when you're part of the inner group. Right. And you're not saying anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. And so for Elsie, it's like, I think it's probably similar. She's just like, I've never faced discrimination because I'm successful today. It's Grace, like, you're your own hurricane queen. You're your own queen of the hurricanes. <laughs> I'm your own, own hurricane. <laughs> you are the hurricane. <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or a... Or I don't know. <laughs> it's a, I don't it's know. It's like, you are a hurricane. <laughs> I was just like, mm. In the best way. Very windy and, and, and rainy and just, just destruction left Strong, and right. Strong, <laughs> determined. Circular. Circular. <laughs> I, I go up the coast. <laughs> On the 4th of November, 1980, Elsie died while visiting her sister Helen in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Sad. Her loss was a shock to all those who knew her, and based on what I read, it seemed like it was no one saw it coming. Like, okay. she just went down for a visit to her sister and then just suddenly fell ill and passed away. Wow. At 75 years of age, Elsie had remained active in her career. The previous year, she had received the Association of Professional Engineers Ontario's highest honor, the gold medal. Wow. Her continued feminist activities had included support for the UN's International Women's Year in 1975 via the CFB PWC. <laughs> Among other activities, she had been a member of the advisory committee for the International Year of Disabled Persons, mm -hmm. which is the other thing she kind of embraces right. is that Her she's disability. like, yeah, I have a disability as well, which was planned for 1981. So she oh. passed away before it happened. Sad. Before her death, she had been awarded four honorary doctorates. <laughs> That's so cool. Was made an officer of the Order of Canada yep. and received the Amelia Earhart Medal for the International Association of Women Airline Pilots. So cool. And she's not even a pilot. And she's not even a pilot. <laughs> they were just like, we got to give this lady something. I only go up in planes that I have designed and have not been tested yet. Yeah. Every time I go up in the air, I want to think it might be the last time. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm that short. I'm that positive. I am a hurricane. <laughs> Following her death, Elsie was inducted into Canada's Aviation Hall of Fame, the mm -hmm. Canadian Science and Engineering Hall of Fame, wow. and the Women in Aviation's International Pioneer Hall of Fame. So cool. So many Hall of Fames. And the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> the Football Hall of Fame. The Baseball Hall of Fame. <laughs> Baseball Hall of Fame. It's in, in Cooperstown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And in 1984, the L.C. Gregory McGill Memorial Foundation was established to financially support outstanding female students of applied science and engineering, which is her continuing legacy. That's so cool. Yeah. And that's the newest addition to our Minute Heritage Minute family. Wow. To the catalog. She's in another Hall of Fame. And that's the a great Heritage one. Heritage Minute Hall of Fame. Yeah, she is. <laughs> That's a great one. Yeah. I'm happy. I'm happy this with that. This one's so positive. Like So positive. What could we say? Her life is good. Her life <laughs> is good. She rarely had a controversial opinion. And when she did have a semi-controversial yeah. opinion, she changed it. And she, After she like listened to criticism and, and was, was like, like oh, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe I was wrong about that. I understand. What? <sighs> a healthy family. Yeah. She kept her name when she got married. Rust in power, Elsie. And rest in power. She was a badass on she was every a level. Boss ass lady. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for that one. I liked it. No After our cute little girls day to the valley, nice to hear about another like girl oh, yeah. being awesome. And woman in power. light of uh, an American, but uh, of an amazing woman passing away last week, uh, RBG. Oh, Ruth yeah. Bader Ginsburg passed away, which uh, she was a power host herself. So. Yeah. She's up there with Elsie now. Up there with Elsie. Yeah. All we can do is fill their shoes. Yeah. Try to. <laughs> Try to. <laughs> Again, thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of the podcast. We always love to have you listening and we love to have you involved in what we're talking about and uh, looking at the information that we post. So please, if you're not already, go follow us on our social media channels. We're at Minute Women Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and at The Minute Women on Twitter. So yeah. 
go give us a follow. Let us know what you think. We love getting messages from our uh, listeners and anyone who has any questions or comments. We also have a great website, which is www.minutewomenpodcast.ca. It's got all the episodes and all of the material and resources that Grace uses to research the episodes and uh, some information about Grace and I if you just want to get to know us better. So thanks. And make sure you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you listen to us on, download the episodes, and make sure you leave us a review if that's possible for your platform, specifically Apple Podcast. Please. Please. If you could leave us a star rating, if you write us a small review, it's the biggest support to us. And thank you to everybody who has done that. We have a nice little rating now. We do. And it's looking really good. It's filling up. Yeah. So thank you so much to everyone who has taken the time to do that so yeah. far. And make sure you tell all your friends about the podcast. Yeah. And if you happen to be like a multimillionaire who thinks that <laughs> we're really great, uh, you're not wrong. We are. And uh, if you want to put your uh, hunch was right. some, of, some of those millions into a, a little passion project of ours, we would so appreciate it. And we'll talk about you all the time. Absolutely. You can be like... Maybe we need, like, tears for our fans right? or something. It's like, if you give us that much money, you're a hurricane. You're a hurricane, and you can sit in on every one of our episodes. You get to sit. You watch them live. I'm making these executive <laughs> decisions on the fly. With no, like, help or anything from Mark. It's fine. <laughs> it's he'll fine. Be, he'll be fine with it. He'll be fine. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Be a hurricane. Be a hurricane. Bye. Bye. <laughs>